big welcome to John Gilbert. Thanks, Rudy. Hey guys, um, I'm actually pretty new to the, to the uh, WordPress space. Um, I don't know about you guys, but has anybody here been in the WordPress community for less than a year in this room? Awesome, okay, so you guys are kind of in my boat too. Anybody who's been in the WordPress community for longer than five years? That's awesome, that's really awesome. So my journey into WordPress started with a nonprofit client that we had. Um, uh, you know, they had mentioned that uh, they use this e-commerce platform called WooCommerce, which I knew nothing about on a platform called WordPress, which I knew a lot about because I actually, I did a little bit of blogging back in the day on, on a, uh, it was actually something called Blogspot. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Anywho, so, um, and so I, I wanted to find out all I could about WooCommerce because I, I learned that it's the largest e-commerce e platform in the entire world. 33% of all websites use WordPress. And so I had to learn more about it. And so I did a lot of reading. I wanted to find out you know, what kind of e-commerce platforms are on there, what kind of software uh, is, is on there, what kind of merchants use, the, use it, and what kind of resources are available. You know, and, I learned that it's open source, so you can really do anything that you could possibly want. But I went looking for articles on, and I found, you know, here's the best form builder, here's the here's the best e-commerce platform. But what I could never find is anything about payments. There's really no talk about it at all. Uh, I saw Stripe, PayPal everywhere. Saw a little bit of Authorized.net, um, but it, there's really nothing about payments. And um, to Stripe's credit. The, the reason that there's not a lot of information about credits is they made it stupid easy to sign up. It is so incredibly easy to sign up for a Stripe account and get going. But um, ignorance is bliss, but at the same time, if you don't know about the, the wider world of payments, you really don't know what you're missing out on, right? And, uh, and that's what I'm hoping to educate people on today. C payments is super complex. But there's a, a few lessons that I can teach people like you, like they, that can help you make a better decision on the payment provider that you choose and, and and why you might. So what I'm mostly going to talk about is is price. And to do that, I'm going to take you back a little bit and I'm going to talk about a couple of things. There's a brief history on credit, on online transactions, um, how fees are calculated, and then once you get an understanding of the components of a transaction, you can understand where you can actually find better pricing that's optimized for your business. So you got a lot of decisions to make when you build a website. You got to find domain, hosting, e-commerce platform. You got to find all the plugins that you're going to use. And usually by the time that you're ready to get your site up and up and running, payments is an afterthought. So how, how many people here actually use a, build their own website or manage their own store? Okay. And how many of you people um, build stores for other people? All right, so um, so obviously, like a lot of people like to hand off their sites to because to Stripe or PayPal because it's it's really easy, right? You just need an email address and put in your address and plug in a few things and you can hand it off. But there are a couple reasons that you should use potentially a couple different payment providers. One is because cost. Two is because there are payment providers that actually pay you to refer business to them. So a lot of people bundle in web hosting, that they, you know, they're selling plugins that do certain things, but there's actually a lot of money to be made um, by referring payments as well. So, so finding the right provider can help you get a little kickback. When, it, when I was watching the development track uh, at WordCamp Miami last, um, just, a few, just a month ago, you know, I saw Chris Lemma and, and Jesse talking about and, and Joe Casaboni talking about side hustles. You know, what, what, what can you do to make a little extra money? Well, you can, you can sell courses, you know, you can bundle in web hosting, uh, bundle in site maintenance and so forth. But one of the easiest things is right before your eyes, just recommending a payment partner can, you know, you can get a little piece of every little transaction there. So um, just wanted to bring that to people's attention. We'll come around to this as well. And we may get a little kind of into the weeds here. So if, you know, if, if your eyes are kind of rolling back at all, just raise your hand. You guys can ask questions. You don't need to ask, uh, you don't need to wait to the end. Just raise your hand and I'll answer your questions right away. So first we're gonna talk about just kind of the, how 
credit evolved over the years. About mm, 4,000 years ago, you had people, uh, farmers, who needed seeds to sow so they could get crops. And when they didn't have cash on hand, or any kind of denominations of money, they, they had a one-on-one -on -one relationship with, a, uh, with an institution that, that, that says, hey, I'll give you some seeds now, but you gotta give me some, some extra stuff once your harvest is done, right? So, and you know, it was about 4,000 years ago. I'm actually, um, what I learned from 23andMe that I'm actually part Neanderthal. And I actually would argue that, um, that my ancestors thought of, thought of lending a little bit before that. I, I, have to, I have to think that one of my great, 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 great grand people was, yeah, I'll loan you a rock, but you gotta give me some of that deer, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, 4,000 years pass, or 20,000 years, however you wanna calculate it, not a lot's happened with credit. So um, I don't know if you guys watched Little House in the Prairie when you were younger, but Pa, he wasn't always cash heavy, you know. He had to, he always he did the best for his family, but you know he he didn't always have cash. And so what he'd do? He'd go to to, to the mercantile uh, and he would and he set up a charge account, right? And so he'd be able to buy a, you know a shovel or or whatever. And at the end of the month, on credit, this person would you know he'd pay off his balance. And there's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. The the store merchant knew that. Pa wasn't going anywhere. He knew where he lived, right? He knew who his kids were and so forth. So there's, there's always some trust, right? Um, and then fast forward to the 1900s, you know, post-World War II, there was a big consumer boom, right? Um, the economy was great. Everybody knew that when they started working that they were gonna make a little bit more money next year than the, the year before. Everybody was climbing the ladder, living the American dream. And so credit started to change. Instead of being a B2B type opportunity, you started seeing credit be lent to consumers. And so you had these Bloomingdale cards or your oil cards and eventually an airline card. So, th so these cards would allow you to walk into a store, purchase products, and at the end of the month, you could pay off your balance, right? So there's, um, it was a bit of a closed loop system, but it still worked, you know? Uh, and then eventually this guy named John Biggins got an idea. He was like, okay, so, you know, people have these charge cards in individual stores, but I'm a banker, I own a bank. I have, I have merchants at my bank and I have consumers at my bank, so I'm gonna create something called a charge it card. And so uh, any member of Biggins Bank could essentially attain one of these charge it cards and use it at one of the merchants who was also a member of the bank. And how it happened was at the end of the month, the business would tally up all, you know, all the credits that are due. They would toss them over to Biggins Bank and then Biggins Bank would deduct that from the account. Um, and that was basically the first bank card. They're the first issuer of any kind of card, right? And, and then payments really took a big change because of this guy right here. Does anyone know who this guy is? Walt Disney? No, close. His name was Frank McNamara. And um, he was eating at a restaurant one day and um, forgot his wallet. He was with a bunch of buddies and he got really embarrassed. His, he had to call his wife and his wife came with the cash and with a checkbook. I don't know what it was, but he's like, this is, I'm not doing this again. And so he created what's called the Diners Club. Um, and so he got all of his friends, um, 200 of his friends to pay a $5 annual fee to sign up for this product uh, and allow them to use a charge card at any participating restaurant. And so he could eat all over New York City, eat all the spaghetti that he wanted to, I think that's spaghetti that he's eating, and, um, and charge it. At the end of the month, they had to pay their bill. So, so it wasn't revolving credit, but it was, it was credit. Then came the card brands. You had um, Bank AmeriCard. Uh, the, banks, the banks were a little bit limited for a while because they were only able to extend credit to certain regions, right? And so there's this company called um, Bank, Car, uh, Bank AmeriCard and they had this great idea. They're like, well, we can only extend credit to people in our region, but we, we just built these rails essentially to allow uh, other businesses to accept cards and so what we're going to do is we're going to be able to, to to license this product out to other banks and let other banks sign merchants and so forth and um, they end up getting so many remittances and receipts to tally up that they became too big and so they end up starting a company called Visa 
And uh, so Bank of America card, Bank of America, eventually became Visa. And so you had all these different car brands and they really fueled the innovation. So uh, you had the Diners Club card in 1946. In the 60s, you had the first plastic card, then you had magnetic strips, then you had EMV chips, and then you had the mobile wallet in 2008. Um, so these guys are really the, these people are really the drivers of, you know, of, of innovation. And, and they're the ones who created essentially the network that we all use today. And so to go back a little bit at the same time, let's look at the first online transactions. The very first online transaction happened in 1972 between Stanford and MIT on something called a RAPnet. Do you guys know what was exchanged on the internet for this transaction? It was actually a gram of weed. Uh, these <laughs> <laughs> the very first thing that was exchanged on the internet was a gram of weed. So there you have it. Um, <laughs> yeah, which is literally the hardest thing to, to, to sell on the internet now today, right? Like if, uh, if anyone has friends in that business, it's very hard to get an account. Um, so then you had Jane, Jane Snowball, who used something called a video text to, to order provisions from the store. Um, and the, the people came and they delivered, they delivered her the goods and then she made the payment to them. Um, and then, which I think is, was also hilarious, the very first transaction that ever happened was... Um, when someone, the first time that someone actually put their financial information into the internet and bought something was for a Sting CD. I just think that's awesome. <laughs> and then in 2003, you got WordPress. And so that's kind of a little history of, uh, of online transactions. Today, online transactions are ever evolving a little bit more complex. Everybody knows what a website is or, or an online location. Um, you know, this, this took place at the storefront, right? And then you have your shopping cart e-commerce platform, which really does the brunt of the work for your transactions, right? It's, it's cataloging your information. It's helping you price, uh, price your products. It's, it's enabling you know, someone to check out. Um, it's, it's saving shipping information, saving customer information. It's doing a ton. And you get a payment gateway. Payment gateway is what actually authorizes and captures the transaction, okay? So um, authorize.net is a payment gateway, hence the name. They authorize, capture. They're also the ones who are encrypting the data. They're the ones who are tokenizing the data so that the merchant can use the customer info again securely. So they can call, instead of saving a credit card on a, you know, on a uh, spreadsheet or whatever, it's just sharing the customer ID, and so all that information is, is saved um, for future use. And then you got a merchant account. And the merchant, the people all, all think that the merchant account and the payment gateway are the same thing. They're not. They're completely different. A merchant account is actually a business account that a business gets in order to deposit funds um, in, into their bank account. The merchant account is essentially um, w what allows you, it, it, it's who determines what you're paying for transactions, how much money you can actually transact in a, in, in a month, and what products you can sell. So this is basically how a transaction works. And when I was talking about before, when we're talking about PA and the merchant and the Diners Club card, the entire credit card economy works because there's checks and balances, right? In, in order to, to have a credit card, a consumer needs to go to a card issuing bank and have their credit run, right? You, then you can, you're told, yeah, you can process $5,000 a month, $10,000 a month, whatever it is. Um, the same rules go for an acquiring bank. And so the acquiring banks are who actually give merchants the ability to process funds. And so these card brands, they're setting the rules for both of these organizations to follow. So they're setting the rules for how much the consumers can spend, but they're also, uh, they're also saying, you know, uh, in order to process funds, you need to have X, Y, and Z done on your website. Um, you also, um, only these products and services are allowed and so forth, and so they're setting the rules. But when you go on your, your website, the consumer purchases something with the software, again, that's doing most of the work. The merchant account and payment gateway are uh, they're authorizing the transaction? They're they're basically going. Yep, does this does this card person have does this card holder have the um, the available funds? Yes, it does, and then the information goes back. And so, 
that's how a transaction works. And so now I'm just going to tell you guys about the two players involved um, in for a merchant, essentially the, the 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 two the two different ways that you can accept funds as a business. You basically have a payment aggregator and a merchant account. Does anyone know what a, who a, what a payment aggregator is? Payment aggregator is what Stripe, PayPal, and Square are. Yeah, and so they're not, they're actually not a merchant account. They're a, they are software that allows you to accept funds without being a merchant. And so they take a lot of responsibility for you and, and they make things very simple. Um, a merchant account, is, so, so, so they have easy sign up, simple to understand rates, they're great for low volume, and they're ubiquitous. You, you've seen Stripe everywhere, right? But there's also some caveats with this. Uh, you know, when you sign up for a payment aggregator, there's nobody who's, who's checking your website, really. There's the, the, you, know, you have some very limited business information, and so this, what it is is Stripe is acting as a very large merchant, and they're allowing a bunch of other people to come on to, to basically borrow their merchant account. It's kind of like the difference between shared hosting and dedicated hosting, right? If, if you just need like a, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you're not really worrying about overhead and so forth, you can, you can absolutely, um, you know, get a shared account. A merchant account is a little bit more serious. It's actually like signing up for a business account, okay? So, so a merchant account provider, they need to, because their acquiring bank has to follow laws. And so when you apply for one, not only do they have to follow Visa MasterCard policies, but they, all, they have to follow financial uh, regulations like anti-money laundering laws, uh, the Bank Secrecy Act, the Patriot Act. So they need to make sure that um, a business is who, who is applying for a merchant account is not wanted. You know, they're not on the OFAC list. Um, they haven't been caught money laundering or so forth. They're also making sure that, you know, the website, um, you know, that they're selling what they're saying they're selling, you know, like you try, ma making sure that if, you know, if they're opening a t-shirt shop, they're going to check the website that, you know, the website's actually selling t-shirts and not guns or drugs, right? And so, um, there's the, so generally when you're applying for a merchant account, you need to be, you need to be able to supply your driver's license, your business license, and then they're also going to make sure that you have terms and conditions on your website, a refund policy, and so forth. So it's a little bit extra work, but you know, there's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. There's some trust here. And so the, the merchant account provider understands your business. They understand the volume that they need. And so what they can also do is give you a a bigger a bigger amount of volume to process per month so uh, usually with stripe they're they're throwing a bunch of people under the account knowing that no one's you know that 70 percent of their customers aren't going to process and then when certain customers uh start to spike in volume they may hold their funds and say okay 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 you just you just process fifteen thousand dollars in a month we need to hold your funds for a week and we're going to ask you some additional information you know so they do the underwriting a little bit later so if, if you know if you're if you have a serious business you're gonna do some volume you do, you, it, it, it probably behooves you to to take care of these um, you know underwriting questions beforehand but most pr uh, providers also merchant providers also have more advanced reporting like being able to chain multiple companies to one account um, hierarchical access for reporting um, and affiliate programs when you, when you say customized rates <coughs> yes There are certain circumstances where you can piggyback on a organizational rate that's already been negotiated with that bank or all banks or that credit provider. So the difference between 2.25% by and maybe 1.70 in some cases, you can negotiate. Absolutely. Yes, you can. You, you can negotiate. It's kind of like, you know, with your, you know, with your, uh, your phone company or with your, um, your, your internet provider, right? Like, like, you know, that if you call them enough, you, you can get your rates lowered down. Um, and generally, uh, you know, like banks, they have negotiated ranks with merchant providers. And so, so someone who does, you know, like in a web designer can do the same thing. They can, you know, they can, they can sign up for an affiliate program with an acquiring bank and say, I want to offer this pricing to my customers. And, and, and usually you have agreed upon rate and you offer that to your customers. Um, and so the difference between the fees here um, is that when you're using someone like Stripe or PayPal or Square, 
they have card brand fees um, to pay. They have dues and assessments to pay. Uh, they have merchant acquirer fees and gateway fees, but they're taking all these fees and then they're just charging you one flat, easy to understand rate. And so if you're doing very low volume, it's nice to know that if I do a hundred dollar transaction, it's gonna cost the same every single time I do. It doesn't matter what card types I accept, okay? Um, but the card brand fees are actually where they're actually the most dynamic, okay? So um, everybody has a debit card in their wallet, I'm sure. Everybody has an airlines card, and maybe some of you guys have a corporate card, right? Debit cards actually cost 0.05% and 20 cents for processors like us to process, okay? Um, these are signature debit cards cost 1.65%. Um, and so the actual pricing methodology that you use kind of determines how you pay these rates or if you actually pay these rates. And I'll go a little bit more detail in, in a second. With a merchant account, generally, um, you're, paying all, you're paying these four rates separately, okay? Um, you're, getting, you're getting billed for, for everything as opposed to um, all at once. And it's, you know, one of the examples I use is, and I'll get to this later, is it's, it's like basically eating at a salad bar. So pricing methodologies, just to kind of get past the last bit of boring stuff here. Um, flat rate pricing, you guys are all, you guys all know what that is, right? 2.930 cents. Uh, merchant providers can also offer this pricing too, but if you're gonna go through the work and get a merchant account, you should actually do what's called interchange plus pricing, which is kind of like wholesale pricing. You're, you know, you're getting charged for everything separately. Uh, and there's some thresholds that, that you can use to actually help you decide whether this is a good decision for your business or not, okay? So whether flat rate pricing or interchange plus pricing, there are a couple different uh, you know, variables kind of that come into play. It's who your customers are, how much, you know, how much volume are you running on your account, Okay, and, and also maybe how much volume you need and, and what you're selling. What, what is plus 30 cents he's paying? So with, with Stripe, it's they, they're paying, or with most merchant providers, they're paying you a, what's called a discount rate, which is basically, it's it, it, essentially, it's, the, it's, it's how much the card costs, right? And so Stripe gives you a discount rate of 2.9%, no matter what the card type is. 2.9% every single time. And then they also charge you a per transaction or an authorization fee. So every time you authorize a card, they're charging you 30 cents plus 2.9% times the transaction amount. So if we look here, this is a $100 transaction with Stripe or PayPal. Um, as you can see here, these are all the different card brands right here. Or um, I took this chart basically from, from Visa, MasterCard, and Discover. These are the most common card types used on B2C transactions. And as you can see here, there are what's called interchange fees. This is the card. This is how much Visa, MasterCard, these card issuers are charging for the card. So World Elite cards, as you can imagine, big money. Right, you, need, you need to have a special kind of credit to have one of these cards, but usually those transactions are a lot larger too. Um, rewards cards, right? If you ever wondered, you know, how you're getting your airline miles, your merchant's paying for that actually. So you're welcome. Um, and then uh, you also got Visa Durban and MasterCard debits. So these are just like, these are the cards that are connected to your, directly to your bank account, right? Everybody has one of these like from their, from their local credit union. And this is what's really interesting. So look how much, you know, there's quite a bit of variance between these card types, right? Uh, but if you're, with, if you're with Stripe or PayPal, it doesn't matter what kind of card type you're getting charged. It's $3.20 for every single $100 transaction, right? It doesn't matter if the card costs 0.05%, you know, 1.65% or whatever, you're getting charged the same rate. Conversely, if you're with a merchant provider, what they're gonna do is they're gonna say, you have to pay the whatever the card type is, you have to pay the dues and assessments, which is basically the cost of the rails, right? The network that's actually being provided for people and also helping the research and development for new products and services like EMV and stuff. But what they're gonna do is they're, so they're gonna quote you with something called interchange plus. And so the plus is what the markup is over interchange. So usually a merchant provider will say, we're gonna charge you interchange plus a half a percent, which means 
whatever wholesale cost of, of the card and the dues and assessments, you're gonna pay plus the same markup. And so your transaction cost looks like this. Now, this really, this information really doesn't mean a whole lot if, there, if it isn't put into context because how do you know which cards are actually the most prevalent? Visa MasterCard and Visa Debits, if you're selling a product that costs under $100, 70% of all transactions are Visa Debit cards. So 70% of all, all B2C transactions are on debit card and they cost less than a percent to process. So a lot of it depends on, you know, um, who, you're, who you're selling to, right? Business cards cost a little bit more as we can see here. So if you're selling direct to businesses, um, th there's also certain things you can do to lower those costs as well. But so what you need to figure out as a merchant is, you know, merchant providers, they, they have some set fees, right? They have a, usually a, a monthly fee, a PCI fee, a gateway fee. Some may roll them all into one, you know, you can, but you can probably pay, you know, $10 a month to $35 a month in fixed costs. Those are monthly costs above the transaction. So where's that break even point here, right? Well, generally when you're working with a merchant provider with uh, interchange plus pricing, your average transaction is going to be around 2.1 to 2.3%. So it's really just a math equation now. So if I know I'm getting, you know, a 0.8% discount on all these transactions, how much volume do I need to run to offset the cost of the, you know, those fixed fees, like the gateway fees and so forth. Um, and Again, this is uh, just a chart to kind of show you the prevalence of debit cards, which are insanely cheap to process, and also the future of cards. You know, in the past 14 years, debit has has raised 371 percent for Mastercard, 600 percent for Discover, um, so, and 200 percent for, for 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 Visa. So. Debit cards are super prevalent, they're getting more prevalent, and they're really cheap to process. So that's really all I'm trying to, to, to show you guys here. Um, and so here's basically using the same data, here's, here's basically kind of the break even points here. So if you're with a, a merchant provider and you're running $0 a month, well, you have costs, and so payment aggregators can be way cheaper. If you're just running a couple couple transactions a month, you should be with the payment aggregator probably. If if price is really all, is all you're thinking about, there's certain features you can get with the merchant account provider that you can't get with uh, with Stripe or uh, with PayPal. But two thousand dollars a month, you can see here, still a little bit more expensive. But once you start getting around five thousand, ten thousand, fifteen thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars the fixed fees aren't weighted so high now, right? So, um, and conversely also, if, if you have uh, merchants who are running $20,000 a month in transactions, a merchant provider is gonna be paying you around 0.1% to 0.2% of transactions. So $20,000 merchant could make you, you know, anywhere between 40 and $100 a month. And that's just extra cash in your pocket. You're, you're doing them a favor by hooking them up with their provider. So, um, you know, just from a cost perspective, that's kind of a bird's eye view of payments. Um, so in review, a payment aggregator is a lot like when you go to Whole Foods, right? You're, you know, I, I just want a meal for myself. I'm gonna grab, I'm cool grabbing some lettuce, some chickpeas, some onions and so forth, knowing it's all $7.99 a pound. Like I don't wanna buy, a, you know, a whole thing, a, a whole head of lettuce, a whole pepper, a whole a whole bottle of olive oil, right? I just want to get a little bit of each, and, I, and I'm okay paying a little bit higher fee for every transaction because there's, you know, I, I don't want to walk away with an entire salad. So, but merchant account is, you know, basically you're 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 making a salad for a family, right? You're not you're not going to hit the salad bar up for $7.99 and get a bunch of chickpeas for your family. You know, when they, when, the, when they weigh a ton. So you're going to go buy a head of lettuce. You're going to buy some tomatoes, a green pepper, and some olive oil and so forth. So um, that's really the difference. It's, um, you know, and there are a lot of great platforms out there. But from a cost perspective, you know, the questions you should really ask yourself uh, in selecting a partner um, is, aside from the cost, are, you know, is the provider integrated with the software that I want to use? Stripe or PayPal, they probably are, right? Because they're integrated with everything. Authorized.net's the same thing too. Um, you know, th there's a lot of, um, they were one of the first to integrate to WordPress and so there's a lot of, a lot of plugins there. Um, 
what features do they provide, right? Um, when will I receive my deposits? Do you want your deposits in a week or do you want your deposit in a couple days? A merchant provider is going to give you your money faster because they've already mitigated risk by underwriting your company. So they know the volume that you're going to do. They know what you sell. Um, some of these payment aggregators, they need to hold money because they don't really know what you're doing for a business. There isn't that, that, uh, that merchant pa relationship like, like Little House in the Prairie. They don't know anything about you. Um, what kind of reconciliation reporting is available? Reconciliation reporting is pretty important if you're a nonprofit, right? If you have donations, um, you want to be able to separate your transaction fees from um, for, from your income, right? And so um, look for a provider that can provide this reporting for you. Um, can they work with my business type, right? Um, a, a lot of, you know, th there's uh, what's considered uh, low risk and high risk merchants. And, and um, usually the aggregators are not working with the high risk providers. You hear from a lot of people who are like, oh yeah, I started running CBD on my, selling CBD oil on my site and I was shut down after a week, you know? Well, if you would have applied for a merch account provider, they would just told you no right off the bat or just told you who to contact. So, um, but, but also like, do they have an affiliate program? An affiliate program could be beneficial for a couple different ways. One, it's paying you, but two, they can, you know, a merchant account provider is going to be happy for the referrals they're sending you. So they're going to give you a more white gloved approach. They're going to, if you're working with a merchant that's already processing, they can do what's called a cost savings analysis. And so um, they can see the rates that you're getting um, and they can cut you a better deal. You know, like a, a merchant account provider, they're thanking you for getting the business. They don't have to advertise. You're bringing it straight to them. And so it's in their best interest to, to make it as easy as possible to sign up. And um, before, you know, uh, 10 years ago, it was a pain in the butt to sign up for a merchant account. I'm not going to lie. You had to fax, fax stuff back and forth. It was an ugly process. And one of the reasons that Stripe and PayPal became... Um, you know, such big players so quick is that they made it painless. Well, most merchant account providers have smartened up and now they have API based onboarding material. Um, they have, you know, their REST API based as well. So um, that's essentially, that's essentially it guys in a nutshell. Um, so if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. I still don't know which would be better. I'm a little confused. Yeah, it's it, it it really it really depends on your individual business, really. I mean, like, you know, I I can't really say which we, you know one's better than the other per se. You know, you want to. Well, it really depends on what you're doing. Did you say earlier if you have a lot of customers, Stripe wouldn't be good. Um, if you run a lot of transactions, um, it's better to do what's called Interchange Plus, which is an, a more optimized way of of paying for, uh, essentially paying for the card types that you're accepting. So yeah, um, a merchant account provider can definitely be cheaper. Um, you know, if you're crossing that threshold of $5,000 a month, that's that's the break even point. Really? Yeah, just talking about, yeah. Both these interchange, what? Interchange, interchange Plus or Cost Plus pricing. That's like Stripe. That is uh, the opposite of Stripe. Stripe is flat rate, one size fits all pricing, doesn't matter what card type you say. And Interchange Plus is variable pricing based on the cards that you accept. Jesse. Okay, so um, as a B2B provider, uh, considering having a cost analysis done, right? On mm -hmm. PC, so we have fairly high transaction stripes, but I'm guessing that a lot of our customers are using rewards cards, such as Miles Card. Mm -hmm. so possible that it might not be in the best interest, um, in our case, to move over. Do merchant service providers have the ability to look at the types of cards that are being used on Stripe to know? Because I don't know when our customer gives us their credit card, what, if it's a Visa debit or if it's an Yeah, Amex, that's interesting, isn't Amex, it? Or a Visa like, Miles card, yeah. Yeah, so you don't know. So and, and so so they're not giving you that data, is that, right? Does that data exist? Is that something that merchants... Uh, so, it, so you can't... Uh, so usually if, if, you know, if someone's with authorized.net, like any, any merchant provider has like this card type, this card type, this card type, you know, um, Stripe doesn't. And so what, what we can do is kind of a little detective work. We, we, we know the trends. We know like based on what your transaction amount is um, and who your customers are, what the mix of cards is. So you're, uh, I would imagine you being an agency, you're probably accepting a lot of business cards, right? Uh, and business cards are inherently much more expensive. Those can cost from 2.2% all the way up to 2.8%. And, and so, and that's before the markup. 
so if, if you uh, so one thing you can do in order to lower these interchanges, so um, tier four business cards are, are, are anything that's, a, so it's basically the business is approved for $25,000 payments. So it, it, just because that is risky, you know, as you know, as Visa MasterCard offering someone the ability to run uh, transactions that, that expensive, they're charging the merchant a much higher rate. Um, and so, but, Visa, MasterCard, Discover, all these card brands, they're willing to lower that interchange rate if the merchant account provider can pass additional data along the transaction. So they're looking for purchase order number, you know, item weight and so forth. So if you can work with the provider, this is called level two and level three data. So the good merchant providers and the good gateways can pass along this info and that 2.8 charge goes down to 2.2. So, um, so, so yes, there's, potential. there's potential, and also, you know, if, if a merchant account a provider wants your account bad enough, they'll just give you a, you know, they'll know that, like, you know, your rate's 2.9, so they got to beat that. So they'll be like, all right, well, maybe this person just gets instead of a half percent markup, we're just gonna do, a tw you know, 0.25 percent markup. Along those lines, if you had a business, let's say you've done a ton of business with somebody, how much negotiation power does the business owner have, let's say, in an interchange? Okay, I'll give you two and a half. You don't know. I'm not going to work for, you know, I'll get, you can get two from me. Yeah. Million a year or yeah, exactly. So usually the more volume that you run, um, you know, the more negotiating power that you have. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and, and that's the other important thing, right, is having a verifiable transaction history. And so the good thing about doing Interchange Plus is that when you go to your next provider to negotiate your rate, they know all your card types. They can say, okay, now I know what this is gonna cost you. But usually, again, like it, the card types are variable, so those are always changing, but the markup is what you're negotiating for. And, and you definitely have negotiating power. Can come back. You run both types of pay yeah. Yep, can. you can. Yep. Now, the one thing that, that you just want to make sure of um, uh, is that it's going to take away some of your volume, right? And so, um, but, you know, American Express transactions cost a little bit more. So, you know, if you're paying with Amex off or Stripe, you know, if, if you're going to pay with debit card, use my merchant account, you know, or, or something like that. And, and a lot of people also do PayPal buttons, right? Because PayPal is play money, right? If I have $10 in my, in my PayPal account, I don't want my wife to know I bought a t-shirt, you know, because I was supposed to go to groceries or something, you know, I'm using my PayPal account. So, uh, yes, 2.930 cents. If, if you're if you're using if you're using a kind of like affiliate affiliate account that you said, is there do you have to reveal that to your customer as well? Do you have to? Um well, I mean, that's up, that's up to you. I mean, like, it's the same with like offering web hosting or or, or whatever. You know, like people white label stuff. Um, uh, you usually, just say, hey, this is my, this is my preferred provider. You know, and. Like, but make sure that your customer is going to get something out of it, right? It needs to be a win-win-win for it to work. You don't want just to refer someone. You know, if you have a software company, you know, like uh, if I'm Easy Digital Downloads, like you know, I want to partner with the provider and give and send everyone to that provider because I know I'm going to make some money. But like, make it worth their while too. Give them a low rate that's going to lower their transaction costs. Like, you can have a win-win-win scenario. It depends whether you want to be vendor neutral. Also. Exactly. Yeah, you can be exactly. Out later, you're toast. Yeah, and, and, and that's another great thing too, because because you have big commerce, they're payment agnostic, right? They just have a bunch of payment providers on there. Pick pick whatever one you want. Um, you know, then you have someone like Shopify, where they just have Shopify payments now. So they went to a merchant acquirer, they applied for their own acquiring license, and became a retail basically like a retail shop. And so they white labeled the solution. And if you've ever looked at Shopify's annual statements from the last six years, there was a gigantic jump in revenue, you know, once once they got everyone to, um, to use their payment service provider. Um, and again, like, as long as you can make it so, so that people have the features that they need. And you know, like people, a lot of times I feel want to be recommended into a solution. They don't want to do, you know, all the research themselves. And, and so, you know, a lot, like a lot, as long as you're, you know, you're solving, solving their problems, right? And, and helping lower, lowering their fees and giving them the features they need. I think, I think you're okay. Uh, uh, what, what would you 
what advice would you give or change if instead of a transaction happening once, it's like a recurring transaction, like you're mm -hmm. charging someone every month, you know, like a hundred or more dollars um, for, for a service? So I would get, I, so I would, um, for a policy perspective, never make the recurring payment period longer than a year. That's that's a big no no with Visa and Mastercard. They don't want to see any kind. Of, they want to see year year yearly renewals essentially, um, and then like um, you know, some payment providers can also you know they have their own recurring recurring engine you know within WooCommerce. My company has a, a free subscription product that we that we just give away as a as a plugin. But if you want to use something like Woo subscriptions or uh, membership uh, manager Pro. You know, I want to make sure that you know the, the the gateway or the payment partner that you choose is is actually integrated to that platform. So you know, you you don't want to like get get someone set up and then find out that it doesn't even work with the platform that they're using, right? Yeah. But, but, uh, related to that, so subscriptions, your your WordPress.org plugin that people use for e-commerce does subscriptions, uh, your version of subscription. Yes. Is there a plan to adapt that to the official Woo subscription? Because there's also a membership plugin that kind of relates to that. Yep. Yes, yes, there absolutely is. And right now, um, uh, so we have our own merchant account. We're, we're a merchant account provider and a gateway. Um, we've, we've connected to our gateway to the most, um, most requested products. We're not connected to everything. But in the case where we're not, um, you know, connected to what, what does not a qual pay to software connection, like with Woo subscriptions, you can use authorized.net and connect that to our merchant account. So. I loved your history of credit card transactions. There's one I suggest that you add, and that's the great Fresno experiment. Oh, no, I'm not. So Bank America mailed, without your permission, 60,000 Bank America cards to the residents of Fresno, California. And within 10 days, it's like 90% of the population of Fresno was only using Bank America cards. It was insane. That's interesting. And then they thought, well, why don't we do that for the whole state of California? <laughs> if you have an address, you can get a free credit card. There was no credit card. Then they did it in Illinois again. The whole thing went just exploded bad. And then I think there was either local ordinances or state laws that said you could not send a credit card unannounced without a credit check. That's hilarious. I, and the, when I went to college, my, I got my first Bank of America credit card because I got a free T-shirt. It was like, <laughs> and I still have that credit card today. So good job, guys. <laughs> and your your um, history about ARPANET. Yeah. I was a user of ARPANET. Really. Fifteen years. And thank you for uh, pronouncing it correctly because I certainly wasn't. Do you have a uh, merchants? Or how, how do we find a, a merchant services company to work with the Bank of America, Wells Fargo? Yep. Yeah, go to the bank. Uh, we we also offer the program as well. Uh, so um, yeah, just 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 look up uh, payment you know payment referral program. And again, like when you're looking at this stuff, like um, just a word of advice: a lot of you know people who have authorized .NET um, you know based software, they can sign up for an affiliate program directly with them. I recommend finding the merchant provider first and cut out the the middle person because authorized .NET is just making a deal with the bank who's then paying them, and then they're paying the referral part. You can cut that middle person out, so. Um. You can also negotiate with the bank with them paying the gateway fee. Absolutely. Yeah, Everything's on the table. Yeah, they'll just chop it up. Usually, you do uh, a single point of contact, and then you just work with them on the gateway. Yep. Yeah, work. Uh, your your payment provider should be your partner. Like they should understand what your goals are, what your customers' goals are, and yeah, you are making the money. And, and also, a lot of times, or, or every single time, actually, an affiliate program, you're getting paid off of the profit. So they don't care if you're charging a thirty dollar monthly fee or a five dollar monthly fee. It's all getting calculated at the end of the month, and so they're splitting you a percentage of the net revenue. So I mean, they just they want the business. I mean. Um, 
uh, obviously they'd like you to charge as much as possible so there's more revenue to, to share, but you got a lot of negotiating power. Have you seen how long it takes in general to create a merchant account? Yes. Um, it depends It depends who you're using. And it, sorry, and it, and it depends and it depends on um, depends on who you're using and a lot of times it depends on on the process some merchant providers will allow you to submit an application without supporting documentation and you can get approved uh, on reserve which is basically like a hundred percent holdback where you can run transactions but you can't take your money out until you supply those documents because a bank they need to do due diligence they need to they need your voided check they need your driver's license they need your business license and so forth but uh, good providers can do it in the same day uh, or 24 hours you know de depending on your merchant type I mean you know there's a couple that can be that can be you know if you're like a vacation club or something you know and it's you know and, and there's a large risk of exposure you know of chargebacks and so forth um, that might be a little harder to underwrite because you know the more confusing your business model is right like they well, they want to be able to say hey what are your terms and conditions what happens if someone buys this you know they want to make sure that you have your refund policy on your site and so forth but you know if um if you're trying to get a you know a pyramid you know they want to make sure that you're not offering a pyramid scheme and so forth and so there's really just a bunch of checks and balances that you are who you say you are your business is selling what you, you should be um you know and also, also that you're you're your DDA descriptor, the thing um, descriptor, the thing that actually shows up on your consumer's credit card statements, um, matches up with what your business is. But and you had a, a delineator of a minimum amount of tra transactions per month dollar like mm -hmm. four thousand. Yeah, four thousand. Yeah, I'd say. Yep. Well, absolutely. Because the hassles of setting up a merger account sometimes, like I help my clients, it takes a month. With all the phone calls paperwork and approvals and whatnot, and then they ended up doing 2000 a month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of time it's a good idea to get your merchant running first, you're right? Because like, you know, like everybody thinks they're going to run $10,000 a month when they set up their website, right? And then, <laughs> and then what happens? So, so yeah, so, so using a payment aggregator like Stripe or PayPal for those first couple months really is a good way to kind of, you know, it, it, because what happens if they run $200 a month or $1,500 a month, like they don't have to, you know, they don't have to have that monthly fee. But then again, there's, you know, there are certain providers that have a very low monthly fee, like 995 that includes everything. So it just kind of, you know, it's what is your, what does your customer want, right? Do they want like a, an invoicing solution that comes free with, with the product, you know, is that worth 995 a month? Is the reporting worth 995 a month, you know, being able to, to you know, to, you know, one thing that, that that, that I, that's always frustrating me with PayPal is trying to find any kind of transactional data after six months, yeah. right? So a, a merchant provider is going to be able to give you that transactional data, and hopefully, thirty different filters to find that data, right? By by currency amount, by transaction type, by card type, or so forth, and allow you to find that information a lot easier. What was the nine ninety five? Nine hundred ninety five dollars. Nine dollars and ninety five cents. Uh, what transaction? Or? So our, our our company charges a nine a nine dollar ninety five cent fee per month for the uh, gateway and the merchant account and the PCI. It doesn't matter how many transactions. Altogether, what's that? It doesn't matter how many transactions. Nope. Nope. That's good. Oh. But you know, like, but like, like you know, every once in a while, you you know, we may not be connected to something, and we may need to connect to authorized.net. Well, there's a, there's additional ten or fifteen dollars, and usually if if um, if we're not connected, we'll we'll give you a little bit more of a break on your discount rate just to kind of make up for that. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah. Thanks, guys.